We are going to take a look at what happened this week at the uh, General Conference Annual Council 2019. Now, it would take a lot of time to just cover everything in just one study, one video. By God's grace, we plan on doing another study or maybe a couple more on this subject. What we want to also highlight here, there is a great deception among us as Seventh-day Adventists. Our leaders are wolves. I am going to say this up front. You can send me emails about this. But they are wolves, like Paul, as Paul mentioned in Acts chapter 20. These men are not sparing the flock. What we saw, if we were paying attention very closely and carefully, that happened during the annual council, 2019, the past few days. This was a scam, a sham. The same thing that happened with the so-called women ordination or women commission, the so-called vote in 2015, and prior to that, two years of study leading up to the 2015 GC session, same exact thing happened here again. And just like 2015, millions of Seventh-day Adventists, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, bought this no vote on women ordination. Just like with this so-called guidelines or statement, as they put it, on abortion, this new statement on abortion that they put out. Many conservative Adventists are praising this just like they were praising the vote on women ordination. But this is a chameleon. You know how Sister White used the word chameleon to describe the papacy? The same applies to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. We're going to take a look at this once again, and we're going to unmask the deceptions there. But before we do so, let's go to the book of John. John chapter 10. Go to the book of John with me. Let's begin with this passage here where Jesus is speaking and also exposing the Pharisees there in the statement that we are about to read. John chapter 10, notice what Christ says here. He says in verse 10, The fifth cometh not but for to steal, and what else? To kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have, what is it? Life and that they might have it more abundantly. Then he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his what? His life for the sheep. That is a true shepherd. That is a true savior. He came to give us life. And the only way he could have given us life was by laying his life for you and I, so that we can have life without the shedding of blood. There is what? No remission of sin. That's the true shepherd. The one who was not afraid to stand up and speak up and to tell the truth and to expose Phariseeism, to expose the deception of the Pharisees. Many Seventh-day Adventist leaders in that room during the, the annual council 2019 they had the opportunity to speak up but the majority of them remain quiet they do not want to lose their jobs they do not want to be in trouble with ted wilson christ came to give us life and he had to expose phariseeism in the last days likewise we must expose phariseeism in our days, we have more to fear from within than without. Many brothers and sisters are just focusing on other events. But when it comes to the issues of abortion, even within the self-supported ministries, they won't talk about this much because it doesn't make too much headline. You're not going to get too many people to be interested in following this. While the wolves are among us, we cannot just focusing on what's happening out there. 
we have more to fear from within than without. Our worst enemy is within. They are the ones who are destroying the faith, who are destroying the foundations, the pillars of our foundations. Notice, let's go back to John chapter 6. Go backward. John chapter 6 with me. Verse 33. John chapter 6, verse 33. Verse 32. Let's begin in verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and what else? And giveth life unto the world. I want that bread. Notice carefully. Skip on down to verse 51. Christ says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. That's the bread we need, not the bread of the Pharisees. Jesus says to the, to the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It is hypocrisy that we saw, that we witness this week once again. We cannot expect anything better to happen. This new so-called document, this new drafted document on abortion, which some are saying it's much better than the 1992 statement on abortion. But brothers and sisters, it's a chameleon. It shows, yes, <laughs> It's much stronger, that is true, than the 1992. But read the fine lines, read some of the words, exemptions, and all of these things. We'll get to that in a moment. All of those things that they added there. Let's go back to the screen. Notice what it says here on the screen. The Bible tells me in Isaiah 44, verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from where? From the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Psalm 71 verse 6. By thee have I been holden up, where? From the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed thee, in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. The Bible tells me that that fetus, that embryo, that child in the mother's womb is a human being that God knows, that God recognizes. We have the scriptures. There is absolutely no way, no reason. For the past 49 years that the church has endorsed abortion, the hospitals, Seventh-day Adventist hospitals, have been performing abortions on demands, elective or selective, whatever, elective abortions. Now, after 49 years of murdering thousands of innocent children, now they are saying that we have now a statement on abortion after they have been uh, make themselves rich by performing abortions and selling the parts of these babies to the power that be to the elite of the world now we have a strong statement they say on abortion after once again 49 years when the bible tells me that christ came to give us life and as followers of jesus christ we need to promote life. We have uh, a commandment, the sixth commandment that says, Thou shall not murder. Original language says murder. Thou shall not murder. And that includes an embryo, a fetus, a child in their mother's womb. It doesn't matter if the life of the mother is threatened. This is one of the excuses that they have given us and even gave at this annual council for reason for abortion. Moving to microphone three. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'm Viriat Ferreira. I'm a lay member, medical doctor. 
and a uh, member of the GC Executive Committee. Um, you know, there are situations when mothers have two children, three children, they have the, the husband, and for some unexpected reason, it's extreme medical reason, you have to make the decision, are you going to save the mother, or are you going to have both of them die? Okay, and the children will have no mother, the husband will have no wife. So I would like to propose that we refer this statement to the committee to include this specific area. It's not an allowance for abortion. It's an allowance for these very difficult decisions where you have to save the mother's life and Thank like you. that preserve life. Thank, Thank you, you so much. What if the mother's life is at stake? Well, it's not for us to decide which one of them should live, the mother or the child. It is for us to put the matter before God and let God make, make the decision on who should live or not. Because Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. Notice on the screen what this says here. Letter 37, 1891. Let heartiness come into your life and be revealed in your connection with those whom God has valued so highly as to give his own life that they might live with him through eternal ages. We must be willing to sacrifice ourselves so that others could have life, but not to destroy life. Now, let's now go to a little bit to look at what happened during this uh, so-called Annual Council 2019 uh, from the General Conference. Now keep in mind, abortion was supposed to be the headline, but what really made the headline above uh, the whole topic of abortion was once again women ordination, where they say, well, we're going to go after these uh, four bodies there who are in rebellion against the General Conference. And then what was the other thing that took most of the time there? You guessed it, ties. Returning your ties. That took up most of the time. While the abortion issue, they give it just a little bit of time. Because taking the life of the infant is not as sacred. The life of the infant is not as sacred, the child, as the ties, as we watched in the last video, how the uh, General Conference Secretary argued that we have to respect the ties. We have uh, to treat it as something sacred. Notice on the screen. From Adventist Review, Adventist Church works to clarify its stance on abortion. Dialogue includes a diverse group of Adventists, notice theologians, medical professionals and church leaders. The denomination has offered guidelines, but not an official statement on abortion in a 1992 document. And as we looked at several times before, the 1992 document on abortion from the General Conference website, it says you can have abortion in the case of rape, incest, and a few other issues. You can have, we can perform abortion. Now, while again, some are saying that this new statement on abortion is more powerful, is stronger than the 1992, it's more biblical, but we're going to see that's not exactly the case. It's politics. You had a bunch of politicians in that room, just like the Pharisees, making it seems like we're making a stand on abortion. But again, think for a moment, after 49 years, now we are coming up with a stand. What did the pioneer say about abortion? The pioneer said it's murder. It's murder. Yet, how often have we heard and read how Ted Wilson will defend abortion? in some cases, while on one mouth, they are saying that abortion is a sin. Then on the other mouth, side of their mouth, they are also saying, but there are exceptions. That's what they were 
again saying in doing this uh, so-called annual council. Same thing they said in 1992. Yes, they strengthened it with more biblical. Think about it. Those same theologians, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, the same theologians spent two years, they say, a long time studying this issue. Well, the Bible al already spoke about this. The pioneers spoke about this. So now we have to rely on the theologians after 49 years. Now, all of a sudden, they come up, they come up with a strong statement. What a scam. What a shame. Did the organization, did we just become an organization, a church? I thought this happened in 1863. Now, all of a sudden, again, remember, this is a new organization. Again, let's go back to the screen. This is the draft. Once again, we're not going to go through the entire draft. It's pretty similar to the 1992, except they changed some things to make it appeal stronger so they could uh, convince the conservative Adventists. And, you know, as they come together, if you read through the document, you can read it over and over. You will see that it does not have some changing of wording from the previous guidelines which, as they say, to make it seem different, it is far from Bible-based truth. It is far from a true Bible-based statement. It's still a pro-choice position because they're leaving room for exceptions. You find the term various reasons within the, the document. When you use words like this, various reasons, then you leave the door open to anything else. What we need is not a guideline, it's a strong statement that says this is the position of the church based on what the Bible says, we do not approve abortion. The position should, should say it doesn't matter the case, rape, incest, it doesn't matter, life of the mother, this is our position. We are going to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone and leave the consequences with God. That's a statement. That's a biblical statement. But again, you read through what these so-called theologians and doctors say. Yes, it sounds pretty good. It sounds very biblical. But remember, if it has one lie, if it has and just a little bit of poison in it. The whole thing is poison. The whole thing is poison. Look at the papacy. I just read an article recently. And the papacy seems like it's, he's exalting Jesus Christ. He's saying a lot of good things about Jesus Christ. But at the same time, you know, when he made that speech, this was while he was canonizing somebody as a saint, which is not biblical. Amen? Well, there is 99% truth, but that 1% error made the whole thing a lie. The rest of the document, although somewhat stronger than the previous statement, is just more double talk. It's just double talk. What we need once again is a strong, powerful statement that condemn elective abortion forbidding all kinds of abortions within Seventh-day Adventist hospitals. Does that mean with this so-called new position now, statement on abortion, does that mean that the Seventh-day Adventist institutions, hospitals, are now going to stop performing abortions? Is that what it means? You are going to be shocked by what we are going to cover next. Again, as I mentioned, for 49 years, we have had this guideline on abortion while they are killing innocent children. Again, as we watch what some of the leaders were saying, they were saying that we have to make an exception. Do you believe that this is a denomination that is ready to stand to defend life? It's politics, brothers and sisters. Let's look at the Catholic Church, for example. What is their position? Do they have a strong statement on abortion? Notice on the screen. 
What's wrong with abortion? We, as Catholic, accept as a duty, because we are Christians, a more vigorous concern for human rights and justice. As bishops, Catholic bishops, we make no apology for being known to champion the weak, the unwanted, and the defenseless. So we speak out once more in defense of the unborn child's right to life. This is the greatest human rights issue confronting New Zealand in our day. No human being is a defenseless as an unborn child, yet there is none at greater risk in New Zealand today. Notice, every human being has an invaluable right to life, rich or poor, strong or weak, young or old, born or unborn. Every human life is sacred. Is what? Is sacred. The directly intended killing of any innocent human being is always wrong. Nothing can ever justify it. It is urgent to proclaim this truth in season and out of season, welcome or unwelcome. But words are not enough. This human right to life, under threat as it is, needs to be fully recognized and more strongly protected by law. That is a very strong statement on abortion. Just like Paul says to Timothy, be ready in season and out of season. Preach the word in season and out of season. It doesn't matter how our culture is changing. Our, the truth must remain the same. Because the Bible tells me God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth must not change based on uh, where the wind is blowing. Notice, GC, Annual Council considers revised statement on abortion. One item on the agenda this week during the Adventist Denominations General Conference Executive Committee Annual Meeting is a statement on the biblical view of unborn life and its implications for abortion. A committee related to the denomination's Biblical Research Institute has been working on this document for some time. They have been working on this document for some time. While we have the Bible and the pioneers writing and Sister White. So we have to depend on this so-called theologian, the same theologian who study the quote-unquote jewelry and then allow it. The same theologian who study, quote-unquote, women ordination and then allow it. It's the same thing that is happening today. What we are going to see here is the same politics. While it's going gonna, gonna to seem like on the surface, the general conference is against women ordination, right? Then we have some what they call rebellion among us where there are some groups here and there, some conference here and there, or division here and there, that are pushing for women ordination, ordaining women. This is the exact same thing that you are going to see with this so-called position on abortion now. The, the general conference voted that this is the stand on abortion. No abortion, right? This is going to be the new, the new thing. Then, you're going to have the hospitals and then some other institutions that allows it. Then there's going to be this back and forth between the general conference and these hospitals because working policy says this and that and the other. You cannot perform abortion. But at the same time, they are the ones allowing it. This is just politics. For years before 2015, vote on women ordination. And till this day, you still see this back and forth between the General Conference and the North American division that are ordaining women and other divisions or conferences that are ordaining women. While working policies of the General Conference says you can, C-A-N, have women pastors. You can have it. It's the same thing we are going to see. It's a deception. We are going to see the same thing. 
there's gonna be guidelines, uh, uh, exceptions, as they said. Notice, back to the screen. It says here, in fact, this is not a new topic for the committee. Notice, this is not a new topic for the committee. Guidelines on abortion were voted on October 12, 1992, nearly three decades ago. The new drafts bring over much of the same language as the 1992 document, and it is not clear why a revision was considered necessary. Did you read it? It's the same thing from the 1992, but it is not clear why we need another one. Well, the 1992 what? Allow abortions. Go back to the screen. The topic of abortion has become more controversial in American politics during recent years as a coalition made up largely of Catholic and evangelical Christian pushes to outlaw it. Do you understand why all of a sudden this is a topic now? Same thing that happened prior to 2015 and 2015. The topic within the religious world and the government was no discrimination and women ordination, having women pastors and things like that. So yeah, in 2015, the conference, yeah, want, want to go along with the wind that was blowing at the time. So that was the issue. Now, same thing. We have the Trump administration, the evangelicals against abortion. Oh yeah, let's oh, oh, make a stand here. Let's, let's talk about the position now of the church on abortion. Meanwhile, while all this taking place, all this double talk taking place, abortion is being performed at our hospitals. This is the leaven of the Pharisees. Notice carefully, back to the screen. The drafts do not begin to address the underlying issues. Notice, the drafts do not begin to address the underlying issues that separate Adventist theology from the anti-abortion movement. The very different understandings of what the Bible teaches about the nature of the human soul and the different principles of religious liberty. In other words, it's a bunch of a do about nothing. This is just to deceive conservative Seventh-day Adventists. They're saying one thing, while on the other end, they're doing something else. What was, again, the main topic? They discussed the most. It was not abortion. It was ties and women ordination. Next, on the screen, notice, from Spectrum. Surprise, surprise, procedural maneuvering marks Monday's annual council meeting. Report 4, October 15, 2019. Delegates to the General Conference Executive Committee's 2019 annual council meeting tackle major issues on Monday. Voting tie, what is it? Voting tie parity for all divisions and reviewing a new statement on abortion. President Wilson gave an introduction to the item, telling the delegates that he hoped they would support the document being presented. Now, President Wilson is on board with the new document on abortion, which again is very similar to the 1992, although they reinforced it with some uh, Bible texts. But just because you reinforce it with Bible texts does not make it right. A strong statement is would be no abortion whatsoever. We do not perform abortion. That would be a strong statement. But you can dream of that day. You will never see it. Notice carefully. Author still followed up with some questions and answers about the process. Is this document a nuclear weapon to the Adventist hospitals? He asked Peter Lindless who heads the General Conference Health Ministries Department. Lenless responded by saying, no, Adventist hospitals perform very few abortions, and he demonstrated the fact with a chart showing the number of live births and the number of abortions. 
it should be clearly stated that the aim is to approach zero as close as possible. This document is not a nuclear weapon. The data affirms that the hospital seriously appreciate the church's stance. Notice carefully. Number one, they admitted that they had been performing abortion. Number two, they said, well, it's only few abortions. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter if it's just one child. Just one child. That it is enough for us to cry out against this. So how many children does it have to be for us to cry out? They say, oh, it's just a few abortions. Number one, that is a lie. Number two, the data that he showed, and we're about to see a clip of that, is a pure, complete lie, brothers and sisters. Notice carefully with me what Spirit of Prophecy says. There is no need to marvel that the church is not vivified by the Holy Spirit's power. Men and women are setting aside the what? The instruction Christ has given. Anger and covetousness are obtaining the victory. The soul temple is full of wickedness. There is no room for Christ. Men follow their own perverse ways. They will not heed the words of the Savior. They take themselves into their own hands. Rejecting what? Reproofs and warnings until the what? The candlestick is moved out of its place. And spiritual discernment is confused by human ideas. Though deficient in service, they justify themselves saying, the temple what? Of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are we. They set the law of God aside to follow the light of their own imagination. This is exactly what has taken place at the so-called annual council, 2019 of the general conference. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are we. No matter what we say, the majority is gonna buy it. And the majority bought it. And here is once again on the screen, this chart that he showed to prove that we have been performing just a few abortions. Now, let's watch the actual video of him admitting that. Notice. I would go to significant lengths to point out a little history. We do have a history related to abortion. If one looks at the statistics around the 1970s, 1980s, and early 1990s, unfortunately and sadly, and because that happens to be the case, statistics which remain heavily embedded in the memories of many. We did not have a wonderful history in our health institutions related to abortion. And so, Dr. Stelly, to answer the question whether this document has been crafted as a nuclear weapon for any hospital around the world that bears the name Seventh-day Adventist or to our health systems, the answer should not only be no, but actually the data affirms and we should appreciate that the health institutions around the world are taking the Seventh-day Adventist stance seriously. And I wish to appreciate that, as well as appreciating, as I did in my introduction, that in the memory of a number of our members is the painful reality of a time when we did not do as we ought. As I mentioned a moment ago, it doesn't matter if it's just one abortion per year. It doesn't matter if it's just one abortion. It's one too many. Because as Seventh-day Adventists, we should be promoting life. We should be promoting the truth. Notice carefully. In the next clip here, he's going to compare, statistically, he's going to compare 
the U.S. abortion versus that of Seventh-day Adventists. Again, to justify that we are not that bad. Notice. But I can assure you that in conversations and appreciative inquiries done on our hospitals in many parts of the world, I have not yet found an outlier that falls outside of these parameters. So Advent Health, and you can read for yourselves, 38,951 in 2016, 23, go through Adventist Health West in two years, 37,271, one termination, Adventist Health, 23 terminations, Adventist Healthcare, 7,000 deliveries, six terminations, Kettering Health, 6,003 terminations of pregnancy. Waldfrieder in Berlin, a beautiful niche hospital with a beautiful obstetrical practice which I have seen. 1,000 live births per year, no terminations of pregnancy since 2012. One needs a landscape of understanding to interpret these figures. And let's move right to the United States where we have very good statistics. The Center for Disease Control, the latest data available, sorry David Trim, the latest data available from CDC is from 2015, in which studies it's been shown that for every 1,000 live births in the United States, there are 188 terminations of pregnancy. So let's take that to where the math would be easy for me. Kettering Health then, if it were any ways within keeping with the national average statistics, would be three times 188, which is about 500. So instead of 500, it's three. It should be clearly stated that the aim is to approach zero as much as is safely possible. We're moving to microphone two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Clifford Goldstein, General Conference. Um, okay, this is a statement, okay? And I'm very comfortable with the statement. Obviously, you could tweak it and how specific you want to get. The question I have is, what ultimately does this mean to our hospitals? And by the way, I wish there was some way that those numbers that Peter brought up that that could somehow get out to the Adventist public because our people don't know that. Our people, a lot of ways, their reputation, rightly or wrongly, and I think now it's wrongly, is they view our hospitals almost as abortion factories. And that's obviously what those numbers are wrong. So I guess the ultimate question I have though here is, okay, this is a statement, but what ultimately does that mean for our hospitals? Are they obliged to follow this? How does this work? As, as explained earlier, uh, the, there will be a committee form that includes the um, Health Ministries Department and a wider group that will create guidelines based on the statement. And those will begin to impact the hospital uh, practice as we go forward. Thank you. Meanwhile, what do they consider is the most important thing? We're turning the ties. That's what they call sacred. Notice carefully on the screen. It says here, despite uncertainty, Adventist church finances are on target. Treasurer says, October 14, 2019, again, as I mentioned, they spend more time dealing with ties and offering and money and all of these things than to promote the sanctity of life. They spend more time on this. And as this uh, secretary or treasurer says recently in his speech 
about the secretness of ties. Let's watch this once again. Therefore, I want to make clear that um, we are not considering this in any more sacred or dealing with it in, in a, any different way than we would deal with any other portion of tithe, even if it is one dollar. Whether it is tithe of a million dollars or tithe of a hundred dollars, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever what it is. And it is treated very much with the same degree of rigor, reverence, and respect. I want to assure the church in every way, every member, every one of the 21 million members we have, that the reason why this matter is critical is because we deal with tithe very carefully. Tithe is sacred, and we do not deal with it trivially. This is a matter of integrity and obedience. An extra caution is exercised to deal with it in the most respectful and appropriate manner. In the most respectful and appropriate manner. Go to the Bible with me. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 23. Notice with me, Jesus is speaking here to the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23. Notice carefully with me, this chapter, this is the same chapter where Jesus, in the beginning, he says, in the beginning of the chapter, he says, verse 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do for to be what? To be seen of men. They may broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the market, and to be called rabbi, rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, but for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are brethren. Notice, verse 16 now. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear, by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. The gold. What's the gold there? The money. The tithes. Yes, tithes is sacred. What's the temple? The temple also represents the body. A person, right? This is the typology there. But notice. And whosoever, verse 18, shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctify the gift? Which one is greater? The money or the altar? The temple or the gold? Which one? Notice. Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein, who is dwelling in there, God, right? Notice. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye, notice, pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the what? The weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Justice. Justice for what? For whom? For the unborn. Defend the unborn. No, 
the money, the gold, the gift, the tithes are more important, more sacred than the sanctity of life. These are a bunch of wolves, as I mentioned before, as Paul mentioned. Now, let's make this more practical and more personal. What is the message for us then? What is the message for us? We read about the rebuke there that Christ pronounced on the Pharisees. He even called them ye blind guides, which straight at a gnat and swallow a camel. Have you ever seen somebody swallow a camel? It's impossible. But with the Pharisees, as Christ says, it's not impossible. That's how deep the hypocrisy, that's how deep the apostasy was. That's how deep it is in our day. Again, as I asked the question a moment ago, what is the message for us? Amen? What is the message for us? We see, we understand the apostasy. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, backward a few pages back. Matthew chapter 5. What is the message for us? Notice carefully. If Christ counseled the disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, don't follow after the Pharisees. Notice, what is the message for us? Chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. And Jesus says, notice, let's look at verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, so he shall be called the least of the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Notice, for I say unto you that except your righteousness, my righteousness, our righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of who? The scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven unless our righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. We can put it this way. Unless our righteousness exceed that of the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the leaders, the modern-day Phariseeism, we shall in no wise enter, enter into the kingdom. It's one thing for us to know about the apostasy, but it's another thing to be right with Jesus Christ. I point you, brothers and sisters, to the Word of Christ. I point you to the one who can cleanse us, who can save us from our filthiness, from our sin, like he said, except our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, we shall in no wise enter into the kingdom. In no wise. Notice on the screen, Spirit of Prophecy tells us here, Rivian Herald, April 8, 1902, paragraph 9. Study. What's the word there? Study. The Savior's words, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case, whatever your position, Enter into the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was of a what? Selfish nature or character consisting of external forms. The righteousness which God requires is internal as well as external. The heart must be what? Purified. Else Christ cannot be enthroned there. The life must be conformed to the will of God. What is the lesson for you and I? What is the message for us? We must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And that means we must have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We must resemble in our lives, both external and internal, as she said, we must reflect the character of Jesus Christ. We must and do all things for Jesus Christ. May I once again point you to Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep, what? The commandments of God. And what else? The faith of Jesus. Whose righteousness? The faith of Jesus. The just shall live by faith. That is the righteousness that we need, not my righteousness, not the ones of the Pharisees, 
and we need to proclaim this in the last days so that many, many could have eternal life, could come to know Jesus and have eternal life because that was the reason why the Son of Man came into this world. The Son of God came into this world because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but what else? But should have everlasting life or eternal life. That's what we need to proclaim and to reflect in these last days. Let's pray. Loving Father, our God, which art in heaven, forgive us of our trespasses, forgive us of our sins, Lord. We have done wickedly in that sight. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Help us now, Lord, to live for you and not for self, to be willing to forsake all, to follow thee all the way until you come again. In Jesus' name, amen.